Hello everybody, this is Clint Locker. This is the third part of a series is survival trapping and snaring mental masturbation. And I want to go and get something out of the way because uh, looking at some of the comments, there was I've, I've been amazed how non-negative they are really. But you know, short, you know, there I keep saying long term, and a lot of guys are only thinking short term. So I thought I'd go ahead and break up what I was gonna do, and I want to go and do what do you do about a short term survival situation what would that really be would it be you're out hunting and you get lost which is probably more probable or you're in the in a winter time situation and your car breaks down and there's just not a lot of traffic you know it could be something like that you go canoe and flip the canoe you know you could be it depends see th this is where i think the fantasy and the reality comes up you know in modern day times if you're going to put yourself into a situation that could possibly have any long-term effects as far as a vehicle breaking down, getting lost, being out in the woods or the wilderness, being on a boat, being in a canoe, uh, anything like that, you know that before you get started. So if you run into a situation where it gets so desperate that you got to start trying to snare squirrels and things, it's not a survival problem you had, it's been a lack of planning problem that you had before you ever took the trip. And that may seem harsh, but that's, that's you, you got to understand that, that's what it is. So short term should be more prepping and more uh, planning than it is worrying about survival. Because, you know, in, in the East, you get lost while you're hunting. And, you know, there are places that you could really, really get lost. But if you plan a little bit, there's hardly anywhere without within, within a couple of days walk, which, you know, a human being in the Army, uh, we could cover 25, 30 miles a day with rucksacks. I don't expect uh, someone that hadn't trained for that to be able to do that. But you can easily cover 15 miles in a day, taking breaks and everything like that. So you can get 30 miles out in two days. So if you're in a situation like that, you don't need to start trying to worry about food. The main thing is going to be water. Are you are you going to go hypothermic? Are you going to overheat? Different things like that. But you just need to get the hell out of there. That's what you need to be planning on. So part of that, on a short term, anything going on, comes to the planning part. So a few examples of me that I've uh, that I can say, you know, I put myself in some pretty severe situations before, uh, not in the military, but but out of that. That you know, I planned way ahead. One of them was I was living up in Alaska, Fairbanks, Alaska, and, in, and when moose season would come, there's a place on the Chena River that I could drive to, and the way that it, you know, shoot around, it gave me something like 40 miles of river in the middle of nowhere before it came like six miles back to the road to where the original pickup was. So what I would do when I was up there, I would drop my truck off get all my gear in my canoe, put it in the Chena River, and go downstream. And when I hit that other end, which was usually two or three days later, because I'm moose hunting, I would then hide the canoe, walk to my truck, go back and get the canoe. That, that was the plan. But during the middle of that, and I had a cooler and bacon and eggs, and I had a tent, and all that stuff was in there, you know, along with the rifle. But I had a smaller bag that was always within easy grab reach of me because I knew if I flipped the canoe in that situation the the terrain and for me to get back could have been a very serious situation so if I flipped the first two things and I mentally prepared myself for this if something like that was going to happen I wasn't going to try to save anything at first except for the bag which had my survival rations in it, so I wouldn't have to worry about food, I could just get out of there. And the other one was my rifle. And on, on the, the, the buttstock of it, I always had six extra rounds. So it was a 375 H&H uh, &H Magnum is what it was. So I'm going up, that was always in my mind. Now, if it would have flipped, which I never had that situation, I could have been in a quote survival situation, and I could have walked out of there in three or four days as long as I, understood some stuff about land navigation which is also part of preparing when you're going somewhere i could have easily you know that happened i've done long canoe trips here we've been up uh when, when i lived in alaska to go way up in the prudhoe bay and we you know you go five miles off the road for you could pull the trigger and you're caribou hunting that could turn into a serious situation 
but as far as snaring up there it was uh It'd have been a waste of time what you'd have wanted to have on yet would be a 22 to shoot ptarmigan probably be your best bet so or, or the caribou you're after and then you know eat what you can and, and get out of there that way so if you're going on an elk hunt trip you know which is probably the most common thing it seems like people get stranded on because of snow and different things like that when you go on you know like if you go in in the truck and you get on your four wheeler and you drive off in the middle of nowhere you always have a bag with you that's got rations. I mean, so it, you know that's what it is. Now, the more severe situation you're putting yourself into with longer distances from civilization or help, you'll want to expand on that kit more and more. And that's gonna to be total up to you. So that's the reason I don't think I could tell you what you need to have in that kit, but you need to figure that out on your own. And I'm gonna explain some of the stuff that I do. So that's, it's, it's more of a, It, it, it's a planning problem that people get in these situations. You know, you, you're all excited about hunting. You got a four wheeler with you that you could have had something on there as far as food goes and extra water and stuff, but you don't because it's back at camp. That's bad planning. Or you're going to leave your four wheeler and you're going to walk off, you know, three or four miles up the side of the mountain, shoot a doll sheep, and you got your stuff back at base camp or at your four wheeler or whoever dropped you off, and you don't have anything with you that'll get you through that that's very bad planning there are parts in the country when you go hunting you could very seriously find yourself in a survival situation but it's not to turn into a mountain man at that time it's to get out of there at that time and if you're if you're sitting around dicking around with, with trying to hunt and snare and do everything like that it's gonna it, it's gonna warp what you should be doing into what into what you shouldn't be doing so you can be very busy doing that but you're you're not being very efficient at what your goal is is to get out of there so prep it you know before you go and think about it all the time. I mean, I carry a neck knife all the time. Uh, it didn't matter if I'm at church or I'm going out in the woods. I can knock knife. I always have, unless I'm going somewhere where I can't have it, I always have a pistol on me. Now, to me, 45s, 10 millimeters, stuff like that make a lot more sense than, than other stuff. Uh, if I was going out and I had a rifle, I would make sure that I always had at least a 22, like a, a Ruger Mark III, something like that on me, that I could then, with a you know a box of ammo that's in, in a Ziploc bag or something, I could shoot some ptarmigan and squirrels and stuff and not spend that much energy. But when I look at a kit, depending how far it is, like I said, you wanna, you wanna make the, the first thing is, what is the chances of more extremity to go on? Because the more extreme it can happen to you, like you know really going out on the ledge and going doll sheep hunting by yourself or your, your buddy breaks his leg or whatever that could turn into way more than what's going to happen to 99 percent of us if we go out deer hunting or duck hunting or going out hiking or something like that so you know let's keep some reality into this but when you're when you're looking at food guys when you're looking at short-term survival uh, what you need to do more than anything is understand what your body needs and what your body wants and what is going to make your time more comfortable and what I want to talk about a little bit is nutrient dense food now one of the things that I really liked about the, the I always get this backwards because it's worded backwards the uh, Woody Beardsman when they did their little challenge which I, I, y'all should go look at after like about day two you could see they were craving butter and some type of seasoning. They're eating pike on top of pike on top of pike. I love pike. I don't want it three times a day. Well, at least not cooked that way. So, you know, your body craves fat. Fat is nutrient dense. And if you're thinking, well, if I eat some of this stuff and then, you know, it's going to make my heart explode, dude, you need to find a new doctor if you still believe that nonsense. It, it, fat does not make you fat. Fat does not make you have heart attacks and it does not make your cholesterol go up. That's been proven over and over and over again. The medical community accepts that now, but they're really afraid to go out and promote that because you think of all the last 40 years and all the sickness from the low-fats diet that Americans been eating, and they got they got a big problem there. So fat's good. Good is the the fat is the best thing that you can carry because one, it's nutrient dense. Two, that's when you eat a good recipe or you go to a nice restaurant. They use lots of butter. A lot of uh, places will use bone marrow in salad dressing to give you that sensation that your body craves, which is fat. Your brain works better when you have fat. 
it and it and it calms you down because you can get the same calories i guess if you took a case of cheetos with you than what i'm getting ready to tell you but after one day one of the cheetos is going to be starving to death and i'm i'm not going to be hungry at all I, I, and i eat like this all the time anyway so it's not that big a deal so nutrient dense you've got fats you got proteins and you have carbohydrates and you know you can break that down however you want to fat can come in a couple of different sources. Now I want you to think back to what the Indians, the first and most important thing that they ate on a bigger variety was nuts. The reason for nuts is it's high in fat. It's high in calories. You don't have to carry a bunch of it and you've got really nutrient dense food. We're not talking granola bars and, and all that other hippie stuff right now. We're talking about real nutrient dense food. So my favorite thing that I carry is planters deluxe mixed nuts my wife knows that if she needs or wants some nuts i've always got some in the jeep always a couple three cans always under the back seat so if i'm if i'm just out somewhere and i get delayed or whatever and i start getting hungry i pop a can of uh, nuts i don't have to eat that many the the fat fills me up and i'm not hungry for a long time now if i try to eat a peanut butter jelly sandwich i'm hungry i'm hungry in an hour y'all know that's true so the fats is where you want to go. They're nutrient dense. Now see this right here is uh, almost a full day's of a 3,500 calorie diet. That right there. That has 2,550 calories in this little bitty can. So think about that when you're looking at other things as far as the nutrition carrying rice and different things which we're going to talk about which is fine they're not nutrient dense uh, taking jerky jerky's not near as nutrient dense as this is jerky is a good food to take with you so I can have this and say if I was going on if I were to go back and try to do that moose trip again what I would do is I would make this more nutrient dense because uh, the fat content of this, 1800, 1,800 of the calories comes from fat. Now, we all know how good butter is, and a stick of butter is 810 calories. Now, let me give you a little survival food that you can take with you, as long as you're not allergic to nuts. And if you'll try this when you're out hunting, or just try it anyway, you'll find out that your body will have all the nutrition it needs, and you're not going to get hungry for a long, long time. If you've ever made butter pecan ice cream for real, you'll find out that how you get that awesome flavor is you take nuts, most pecans, and then you you cook them in brown butter. So you put the nuts in the pan, put the butter in there, you keep the temperature low, the butter will brown, you keep, you know, push, just taking your, uh, your pan and moving it around, it coats all that, the butter soaks into the nuts. And now, if I do that, I've got one can of these that's gonna be over a whole day's nutrition. So if I was going back to the, the canoe example, I would take three of these that have been doused in butter with some extra salt, and then I would let them dry, and I would pack them in my, my food saver in a thin layer, and that would be about this big, those three cans would be, and I've got three days of all the calories and, and I'm not going to feel hungry even though I'm not eating the volume because of the nutrient dense part of that. Now there's that that's a that's a one of the best survival foods that I can think of. It's not a long-term survival thing because eventually the butter will get rancid. You know, so you know you're only talking about a week or so before you got to start changing that out. But that's that's my main thing right there. Butter and nuts. It's got everything that your body wants. Now, this is another product that uh, most a lot of preppers and survivalists don't do a lot. I got this at Walmart. It's uh, coconut oil, and it costs me, this big old thing cost uh, $12.24. We cook with it because we want to have good fats anyway. So we cook with this at home. It doesn't taste bad by itself. It has a little bit of a coconut flavor. It is, it's an oil from coconuts. And it, even though it's not from an animal, Check out the nutrient density of this. One cup, one cup, we're talking a cup's not very big, guys, has 2,000 calories. So you could just eat it if you wanted to, which you could, and it wouldn't kill you or, or it wouldn't taste too bad. But if, you're, if you, get some, you do forage for some greens or you do catch a squirrel or something like that, 
you can take a tablespoon of this and put it in end with that while you're cooking it in aluminum foil or pan or whatever you have and now you just you just ratchet it up the nutrient density of that food and you're not going to be as hungry as quick you can get your your brain off your belly and start getting it to what you you need to do so this is the two of the things and and i tell you how important this is going back like going back to the indians again the people that lived it when you hear all of the accounts of when they killed a buffalo they might have tried you know as a a thing where they would eat part of the liver or the heart or whatever for you know whatever ceremonial reasons then they would start cutting the meat off the bones and they would get to the leg the leg bones and the and stuff like the bigger bones and they would scrape out the marrow that was the first thing they ate why is that it's the most nutrient dense part of any animal now a rabbit has bone marrow but there's not enough in there really to deal with you know you need something about like a deer uh, hog something like that for that even to get up in range but a cup of bone of bone marrow a cup again we're not talking quarts and pints we're talking cups has 1784 calories that's nutrient dense body goodness right there so that's kind of what I want you to, to be thinking about so when we're thinking about short term if you reality check if you're going to go out and go, well, what if I don't have that? Are you going to have your floral wire? If you have your floral wire and you don't have your nuts and butter or whatever you choose to use, whose fault is that? That's yours. That's lack of planning. If you go out and you've got your four pound super duper Rambo knife that's supposed to, you know, do everything in the world and, and cut cars in half and you got that four pounds with you, well, don't you think it's a better idea? in a situation that most of us are going to be in to have it in some type of nutrient dense food when you go out and you do that because when i'm looking at when i'm looking at a short-term survival situation me i'm a trapper so I, I automatically skew what i'm thinking when it comes to trapping guys this is a dozen of real snares that really catch and really hold animals this is um, a 560 force, which we're going to get into this in great detail. 560 force, one by 19 on the front end, three and seven by seven, three thirty second on the back end. And I don't need springs and garbage and, and all this other stuff out here to get it to fire. An animal touches it, the animal gets caught. That's what a real snare does. And even with these you're going to have about a 2% breakage and a 564 one by 19 snare has the breaking strength of over a thousand pounds. Now I want you to think about that. I'm still running a 2% probably on average with this setup for beaver, coons, coyotes, different things like that. And I'm running a 2% loss just from cable breakage. And you're going to go out and try to do it with 550 cord. It's ridiculous. It really is. Now, I've got these in plastic bags. Now, before I turned on the camera, I'm like, what does a dozen of these cost? Not cost, but what do they weigh? A dozen of these type snares, which which I've held, uh, I'll, I'll explain that to you in a minute, but that weighs one pound. If I have two dozen in my pack, I've got two pounds. Now, what makes better sense? The great big old Rambo knife? Are having 24 pieces of equipment that can actually feed you see that's the solution you're gonna to have to come to on here if, if the knife is so important and you just can't carry the extra weight then you need to carry food or something but for me I know in almost any situation that I'm ever gonna be in there's gonna be beaver groundhogs raccoons um, uh, porcupine or um, oh, those little shell possums armadillos which I can catch easily in all this. I can catch rabbits in these, but if I was going in an area where I thought I didn't have as big a chance of catching raccoons and stuff like that, I would have one of these like this, and then I would have one that is using 360 force, one by 19 cable with micro locks like this has on there. And then I can catch all the rabbits in the world I want to very simply and quickly. So inside of my pack, the way that I look at it, if I'm ever gonna be in a situation that it could turn more than just a walking out in four or five hours type thing or maybe more than a day or two i'm going to have two dozen snares with my high density food 
with me and I'm doing this because I can stack a function here. And, and I, and I want to kind of give an example of what this is. See, preppers that only store food are missing so much of the point of storing that food. Because you can only store so much. So if you, if you store, like we always keep about a year, year and a half on hand, all the time. That's awesome, that's great. If I needed to use it, and it wasn't something like an epidemic or something like that, I can, within five miles of my house, I can go out and catch some raccoons and some beaver, some deer. Two of these snares will always be for bigger animals like hogs and deer when I, when I pack it for real. So that's a little bit different snare, which we'll, we'll, we'll definitely show. But just within around my house, I can probably realistically, over the course of catching one or two animals at a time, because in, in that part you're trying to farm, you know, because if you didn't have electricity and freezers and all that type stuff, you have to take that in consideration. I can easily supplement the storage food with with uh, with the snares, and I can expand it. So if I'm in a short-term situation, the smart play to me is to have the nutrient-dense food, have some filling food for just for comfort in belly wise, which I'll, I'll explain here in a second, and then I'm going to have my snares because if I catch a raccoon with one of these snares, I've got 11 snares left. It's pretty much a, a one usage piece of equipment, but I've got probably three days on that. Now, if I use that with some food that I bring, I can expand both of them dramatically in different directions. And I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna explain this to you. So this is more looking at your survival in a system of prepping and trapping at the same time to get a bigger volume outplay. So one of the things, if I think it's going to be a, a lot, little bit longer term possibility, I always throw a, a couple of cans of butter and you can buy from, from different survival places canned butter now pretty easily. Uh, the best ones come from New Zealand. It's awesome. It's better than what you get at the grocery stores around here. So that's really good stuff. That's high, that's high denture because like I said, a stick of butter is 810 calories and it's comforting when you eat it and you can make stuff taste better. When I was in the military, I was in the habit, on the side of my rucksack, I always carried an extra two quart canteen. If I ever needed the canteen to hold water, I had it to hold water. That's not what was in that thing most of the time. Most of the time it was two quarts of crushed up ramen noodles. Because when you're sitting there and you're kind of cold and, and everything, it's nice to have something that, that kind of reminds you at home. So we're going to use that as a system. So. I love ramen noodles, especially in that situation, because it's comforting, it's easy to fix. You could replace this with rice. Uh, neither one of those are high uh, density as far as the nutrition. If you're really gonna get serious on the high uh, density of the nutrition guys, look into lentils and quinoa and stuff like that. Both of them swell up in water. It's kind of the same thing. There's, a, I mean, it, it's not even comparison of the, the two things, but in the army, we use the ramen noodles. I could take parts of my MRE with the cheese and stuff, and I can make all kind of stuff with the ramen noodles that was more than just like survival-y type food. And it puts you in a better mood so you think better. So what I would normally take is I would always have ramen noodles, or I'd take rice or quinoa or lentils or something like that with me. And then I would have the coconut oil, because this doesn't get rancid like butter does, you know, two, three, four cups in a, in a a good container and you've got I mean you've, you've already got a day and a half of your calories right there plus what it does is when you're you, when you're cooking you can add it to soups or ramen it gives it that fatty flavor that's so good and that texture in your mouth and you can go about it that way and then I always have a few spices with me and they're always good to, for me they're salt pepper garlic powder and smoked cumin I can make pretty much a tire taste pretty good with that you know, and another thing about being in the military, if, if you've ever been around combat arms, you can't go find a rucksack pretty much. It doesn't have hot sauce in it. And, you know, so we would have that all the time. So what my plan would be, okay, I'm out. I've got my snares. I've got my nuts. I've got some rice or ramen noodles or lentils or whatever it is. I've got a few spices. I've got a fat with the, the coconut oil right here. So let's say uh, I need to be moving. Most animals like raccoons and beaver and stuff, they move at night. Groundhogs move during the day more. So I mean, you just, you, wherever you're at, you know, like I've never trapped a marmot out in the West. So, you know, if you're there, you need to know everything you can about marmots. So 
what I would do is if I, when I decided I would set up camp, wherever that would be, to sit still and get some rest, I would go and put out the snares, hoping to catch no more than one or two animals. I'm hoping if it's going to be a raccoon size or something like that. I'd go check it in the morning. I would take the animal out. I would skin it. I would debone it. You know, I would do all that, and then I would cook it. So what I would do is I would cook. I would cook the raccoon, and then I would mix it in with the ramen or the rice or the lentils or whatever you're going to do. I would put a big helping teaspoon of the coconut oil or the canned butter I've got and I've got a very hearty stick to your meal ribs and with all that extra fat going in there you can get a lot of stuff done that way because the worst thing you want to do in a, in a short-term survival thing is going hey I'm in a short-term survival thing I must trap for animals because this is what I've trained for the whole time if it's short term no it's to get get home where you got a refrigerator I mean that that's common sense right there so Keep in mind what it is. And if you use your traps in conjunction with this. Now you could say, well, why don't you take uh, 110s or, or anything like that? Well, I didn't want to show that right now. For the simple fact, a snare with a little bit of practice can catch animals. A good snare can catch animals. Uh, a 110 up to a 330 body grip. People get really nervous that aren't used to them every day. You see someone like me handling the 330, you think it's like someone else handling an apple. I give a non-trapper one of those traps, they start literally shaking and scared to death they're gonna lose their fingers for some reason. Now, if I was in Texas, per se, this snare right here, the same design, same loop size and everything, I've held up to over a 400 pound hog in these snares. 400 pounds in that snare. He had nuts on them about that big and the tenderloin I took off of that thing was bigger or as big as any beef tenderloin I've ever seen. So, and that was held by that. So I can catch hogs or, 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 or do whatever, but I'm gonna supplement that in to the stuff. Now, if you're catching a hog in a three day situation, you're probably gonna be wasting money are you wasting meat? So I don't know if I'd go that route. So the first rule is you take high density food with you and it's energy for your body, not necessarily to make your belly full because the mission is to get out. Rule two is to have food and then a way to catch some animals to supplement and extend the high density food so your belly feels better. See, that's, that's, to me, that's a pretty simple plan and it makes a whole lot of sense. Another thing that you really want to think about in, in just a two or three day episode, when I went to the, the Arctic Survival School for, for Air Force pilots, I'm one of the pilot, but I got to go to the school, we had some British SAS guys there. And they were also taking the school. And Americans, coffee drinkers, so we, you know, we, we snuck in some coffee. And they're from Europe, so they're tea drinkers. And the, the interesting thing that one of them said when we're sitting around the fire one night is, what they teach us when we get in a survival situation, they would taught this in their version of our SEER school, is once you're out of immediate danger and you've got your climate under control, so if it's 40 below zero, you get a fire, shelter, something going like that. Once that happens and you're not in danger, they teach them to make tea. Now, why do they teach them to make tea? Because the tea is something that is common with them. It comforts them. And while they're watching the water bowl and they're, they're sipping on the tea, they're calm and they can think. Now, that's something you need to think about in a short-term situation. Is don't go balls to walls till you sit down and make some freaking tea or coffee or something like that. It's not only going to take you 15 or 20 minutes to clear your head about what's really going on and you can make a plan from that point. I thought that was genius the way that they, they did that. Another thing from somebody that's lived out of a rucksack for months at a time Drinking water over and over and over again, it will drive you crazy after a while. I was a big uh, component of Tang because I could drink it hot or I could drink it cold, but it was a flavor. You know, I'd always have, uh, you know, dehydrated coffee or freeze dried coffee that I could make into coffee, but at least once a day I'd want to have a flavored drink because that's what we're used to in America really, really help you out on your mental ability when you're out there, if you're in a situation like that, not just to drink water over and over and over, especially if you're, if you're, you know, relying on iodine pills. Stuff tastes gross. So a tang really helps that out. 
So, you know, think about that. Now, one of the things people, like I said, if you've got room for your great big tactical rifle or your great big tactical knife, which a knife is a weird thing to me because anybody that looks at a knife over a small woods axe has forgotten the face of their fathers. When you look at the guys that really lived in the woods, their most prized possession was their axe. Now, this is a little side tangent here, but guys, a $25 hatchet is misery. When you get a really well made, and the best ones that I know of come from uh, Sweden and Norway and places like that, little bitty, you know, like trapper hatchet type things is what they carried. Your whole world gets better out in the woods. And they, and they didn't do that. So I mean, they had the opportunity back then when they actually lived in the woods all the time to have a big honking knife, but they had a small knife and they had a really good quality ax. I'm talking one you can shave with. You can't do that from one from Walmart or the Sportsman's Academy or somewhere like that. So keep all that stuff in mind too. Now, if you if you can't grab your little bag with you when you when you know something has happened or just happened, you're not going to have your other stuff with you anyway. So it's kind of mute to go play the word game of what if, what if, what if, what if. There's always a what if that that you can't handle, and that's just a fact of life. If you're hurt, the last thing you're going to want to do is try to go out and snare a bunch of squirrels because you're hurt. But you're going to need that to be able to make better decisions with a high-density food to get out of there. So that's what I want you to think. The biggest thing from all this, guys, is it takes discipline and commitment till it becomes a habit when you're going out where there's any chance of, of anything going on with, with survivalness. It takes that discipline to always have some high-density food with you. Maybe snares, maybe not. Uh, pistol, maybe not, depends on where you're at in your state laws and all that craziness. But every time you go, like a habit that I'm in now that can sometimes drive my wife crazy, that was beat into me from day one a basic trainer. You never, ever go anywhere without a canteen of water. I mean, we didn't go anywhere without a canteen of water. I think that's the only reason they made those big old cargo pockets on the side of your, your uh, BDUs when I was in is because it fit the one quart canteen. So if we were out picking up trash, we had a canteen. If we're going over to repel, we got a canteen. If we're not in, El, you know, all the 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 regular, you know, go to war stuff, we always had canteen. I'm that way now. You never see me without a drink within arm's length. That's a habit that comes from discipline of always doing it. And it's the same with the having high density food with you, and some other things, you know, that you'd want in that bag, or probably some a couple of uh, army ponchos with some um, bungee cords. We lived none of those things. We could live pretty much through a hurricane with those things and not get wet. Once you learn how to use them, they're an amazing tool. It's all you need for a tent if you're going to be in a survival situation. You know, I'd much rather have that than try to build something out of wood and burn all that energy. You know, I'm just saying some, you know, some maybe some dry socks, some dry clothes, something like that. Something you can fit in a small backpack that if, if the whole world starts going sideways, you know before anything else happens you grab that bag and then you got that bag with you then you got your stuff with you and you got a neck knife that's on your neck and you you if, if at all possible and legal you always have a firearm with you now you've got some things you can work with and you can do the mission is of getting out of there not becoming a mountain man